and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster behind Fates of Mankind, which is currently kickstarting. In the red corner, we, ha we have Mateo. And in the blue corner, we have Andrea, a.k.a. Kataf. How you guys, how you guys doing today? Or tonight, in your case. Hey there. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, we're just chilling here. And that... I, I believe I believe Matteo is muted. No. It's yes, good. I'm muted. I'm back and I'm pretty excited to be welcoming your temple. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Can't wait to uh learn something and share something with you all. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's a place of enlightenment. Yeah. So Enlightenment and drinking. So And drinking. I love the second part. Yeah. With that with that said, um, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to, uh, the to to um to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, this is oh. yours. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I was, I think, almost a, uh, not even a teenager. I was twelve. Uh, when uh, my best friend uh, approached me and said, uh, we have this new game to play, and it's super cool. There are dragons in it, and you can like be everything. You can be a warrior, a wizard, uh, and you fight the forces of evil, and then at the end, uh, you get a lot of stuff to equip. It's super cool. It's like a computer game, but it's like made by people. Mm -hmm. And it it was like my first Dungeon and Dragon experience. It was 3.0, I think. Yeah, 3.0. And then, after a couple of after after a couple of night, uh, I was really young. So night back then, like it was up until nine or something like that. Uh, I went through the chore of reading all the four basic book needed to become a dungeon master and so the year after i get her around some friends and started my first table uh for dungeons and dragon and it was like a slippery slope from there then came uh, 3.5 and i was so super excited i remember like playing uh, Neverwinter Nights 1 and Neverwinter Nights 2 on my computer. And then uh, after playing uh, these new and wonderful adventures, I just went through writing a lot and preparing a lot of encounters. Uh, when I go back to that time, I remember that it was a little bit cringy, like mm, dragons everywhere and everyone was like super epic overpowered. And it was really, really fun. And when we grew up, it was time for Vampire the Masquerade. And I remember so fondly Vampire. Even if I really think that it's one of the most unbalanced game ever created, um, it, it is probably one of the most approachable, if you like that kind of background, of course. You have to be a little more on the... I wouldn't say gritty side of things because you know I I don't like that much defining a game like to be grit or dark because you don't always get a game to be grit and dark if the table is really fearful. So it's like, but you you have to like vampires, something like that. So then came vampires for a few years, and then we had. Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, and uh, for a while we had uh, a few more indie games. And then uh, when we were, I don't remember, uh, 20 years old, 21 years old, we decided to try and create our own game. 
uh, me, Andrea, and another friend uh, of ours, uh, we decided to take a proprietary IP. I wouldn't say which one, uh, but it, it's about uh, Amers and, uh, and war. And so we decided to try to create our own uh, tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. And it was like an effort, uh, one of the biggest effort that we ever made, because when you start create something, you start from some homebrew rules, everyone has them, even people that is really, really close to the vanilla, uh, to the vanilla rule book, sometimes has to meddle with the rules. So uh, you always have some kind of homebrew rules. Mm -hmm. And then you start from there, and then you get to, uh, how, does, how do you invent a combat system? How do you invent a, a magic system? Uh, do they do they work together? Do they do they cancel each other out? So if you are a mage, will you just destroy everything? Will you like impede a fighter from fighting well, or something like this? Or how do you create a system that let you grow as a character? So we went through like years and years of development for this game that as had no future at all. It was a proprietary IP, so it was like um, uh, a personal uh, exercise of ours. Mm -hmm. But we managed to finish it, and we played uh, we played a few games with it. And right now, I am I am older and wiser, and there were a lot of like gray zones and stuff that needed to be improved. But it was fun. And then, uh, after closing that project, um, in the meantime, we still played a lot of games. Uh, we had tables all around, and we decided to, I don't know if, uh, if it's correct, but m uh, me and Andrea, we do talk a lot with each other. Like, he's my best friend. Uh, he, he was um, uh, the best man at my wedding. So we have, like, this connection of talking about everything. And one of the stuff that came up all the time was this, how do you, uh, how do you picture an utopia of uh, like an um, MMORPG? So what's your best idea of, our, of your MMORPG that will like satisfy every every needs you have like that you sit uh, in front of your computer and you are so happy to play that for like days to end and uh, and it's weird because we didn't start from the roots we started from a background we started from the story mm -hmm. and and we decided that yes this background is really really cool of course then the MMORPG wasn't that cool. We are not like we we do not develop games. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yes, and developing yeah. MMOs is one of the most challenge is one of the most challenging. <laughs> exactly, forms of exactly. Game. Whether you're developing exactly. in a sandbox style or a theme park style. Yeah, it was like uh, even if we are we weren't that young, it was like uh, a, a child game that we were playing with each other. But the background was so, so cool. Like the idea itself, how, how the world was building up was, was so beautiful. And so we started to like chip in some part of rules, some little, uh, uh, I have an idea here, you have an idea there. And Andrea was the, the most prolific one of the two at the beginning. Like uh, he prepared the, the um, the seed for our entire system of magic, um, but we took a break mm -hmm. from the idea of that would have been uh, after a while fates of mankind, and then in 2020 after COVID, uh, we are not that after COVID that much, but uh, after the first part of COVID, I decided that uh, I wanted to do something bigger. I wanted to create something with Andrea that 
that met the expectation we had with our like uh, our ideal game, like the game we want to play. And so I started to write that down. And after a while, I I asked Andrea if he was on board after creating like a core rule set. Like, I don't know, I think that combat and a little bit of how item uh, works and so on and so on. Like the core rule set uh, of how you sit and play a game, it was like super raw like super, super raw. We changed a lot from it, but, uh, and he said, yes. And so it was the beginning of like creating this book. It, it's hard to say when we started working on it, because I will say like somewhere around 2016, 2017, but this is the, the short story, the short version of how uh, in 2023, we decided in December to launch our own Kickstarter with an almost finished game that we are so freaking excited to like let people play with it because we play with it and it and the most beautiful part is that it works. After all these years of working on it, of playing with it, of inventing, of discussing it, of uh, even fighting a little bit with each other because it's normal. I think it's normal when you create something that you disagree on something. That's perfectly fine. And then we we gave it to some people, our playtester, that weren't us. Because sometimes when you start creating a game, you normally play it yourself. Uh, and then we... Uh, we said, no, you have to try it. You have to, someone else has to play it. And they were so freaking excited. Like, I didn't even expect that. I was so scared about combat uh, because I think that uh, besides some really niche cases, uh, if you try to make a combat a little bit tactical, a little bit complex, I would say, uh, and not just uh, a narrative combat, for example. Uh, I'm always scared that combat could lead to slowness, to clunkiness. Uh, but everything, almost everything, went smoothly, and uh, I was so happy. So that's the that's the story on how we got to having like. Fates of Mankind on Kickstarter and why we are so proud of it. I don't know if, Andrea, you want to add something that I forgot, of course. Uh... Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Yeah. And I think I can understand that hesitation when it comes to um, combat. Um, I do think because it is it is very much a balancing act, like so much, like so many things in uh, ro in role playing games are a ba are a balancing act. Because you you have to you have to make it so that it's engaging, but you also can't have it that it's um, that it ends up being a slog. And I've I know some people are like we need to we need to make combat quick quicker and quicker, but. Sometimes in doing so, you make it so quick that it ha that it um, swings the pendulum around too far. You know, there's this mentality of complex, bad, simple, good, and I've always fought, I've always fought against that because it is a pendulum, and whether you swing too far to to the left side or to the right side, the problem is you swung too far. Mm -hmm. Now. You get it talks on the Kickstarter page. It talks about you guys using a D12 system, and there's a lot of ways that 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 kind of thing can be interpreted. So, is it a is it a case where you guys are using a D, D12s as a die pool? Is it a is it a single die um, mod, modifiers plus? Is it a case of roll low? What sort of approach do you guys have with the D12? The lonely D twelve. Uh, essentially, we we use the we we, we only uh, physically roll uh, D twelves on the on a table or virtual table, uh, whichever whichever it is. Um, 
and it's uh, a, a, a versatile pool in a, in a, in a way that, uh, uh, depending on uh, what you're uh, rolling for, uh, you might be rolling between 1 and, uh, I don't know, uh, 12 or 15 uh, dice, uh, depending on, on, on uh, your efficiency in that, uh, in that department. Um, and uh, so that's the, the the simplest answer is uh, yeah it's a d12 system because we do roll uh, the d12s uh, we, we of course uh, have uh, uh, various thresholds of uh, difficulty that you have to match with the uh, with the dice and those uh, also depend on the uh, on the specific uh, needs uh, for the throw or for the context uh, some of which is uh, left to, do, to specific rules, uh, um, much of it is uh, in the hands of the narrator of our game master. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's... Um, if, you, if, uh, if you need a mental, mental picture, uh, that's pretty much... Pretty much, pretty much bleh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's uh, pretty much it. Uh, it's... Um, uh, it's a, a sub highly subjective pool of uh, the 12s so that each character uh, may be asked to to roll depending on, on the situation. Mm -hmm. So it, def it definitely sounds like a D12 pool, and I'm just glad to see the D12 get some use because that's a very that's been a very lonely dice over the years. Uh, I heard that before. Uh, the other reason we we ended up using the twelves is because uh, in some cases we uh, find it uh, better to uh, to ask uh, to ask for a, a d six or a d four result uh, uh, at least uh, when we are counted up uh, the the numbers on the dice sp uh, specifically instead of uh, uh, checking for a difficulty. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the D12 uh, uh, comes in uh, useful because, uh, uh, put simply, it can be divided in, uh, in a D6 and a D4 uh, uh, at need. Um, at, uh, basing an entire system on, the, on a D6 or a D10 uh, would have been a bit more uncomfortable in that uh, perspective. Yeah, I can, I can certainly understand that. Now... With that said, this is most definitely a fantasy game, but what constitutes fantasy is a very, is a very, very wide net. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something I've, ta I've talked about in the past, how just because something's high fantasy doesn't mean that's narrowing it down all that much. So what style of fantasy would you say Fates of Mankind is? Would you Would you say that it's going for high going for low going for dark going for grim dark where where does it fit in the spectrum uh, I'm gonna say a bit of this a bit on that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that um, uh, personally I've always I've always seen uh, high fantasy be, being connected to you know there's gonna be uh, elves and dwarves uh, etc next to the to the humans you know uh, so in that perspective, uh, uh, no, we don't have uh, uh, many other sentient races that you're supposed to play. They are there, they are. For, ex for example, we have uh, uh, mythological creatures who are uh, both sentient and uh, unconscious. Uh, so you can uh, meet those, and uh, I guess that you can uh, make arrangements uh, to, to even play one. Uh, but it's not uh, baseline. Basically, you're supposed to be a human. Um, so, would you say we, Fates is more sword and sorcery in that in that sense? Then, uh, yeah, probably. I mean, in uh, well, generally speaking, it's uh, magic and the supernatural in general are pretty damn pervasive uh, across the entire setting. Uh, so. So yeah, you can't you can't say high fantasy. You can't even say low fantasy because low fantasy implies that normally implies uh, that uh, a, a normal person may may go for years with, uh, 
uh, without seeing uh, strong signs of magic or strong use of magic or uh, whichever uh, is, uh, is uh, more likely. Uh, in our case, uh, that is false because, uh, generally speaking, most humans carry at least a portion of uh, supernatural powers, some less, some more. Uh, so even the random man of the street uh, will have met people uh, with powerful uh, uh, supernatural powers in you know, one way or another. And uh, in some cases, depending on uh, where you live, uh, how much you travel and uh, what you do for a living, uh, you may end up seeing a lot of uh, uh, high power stuff, of um, supernatural, myth mythological, legendary stuff, uh, miracles on the daily, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, even even with that, it it looks like you you are using like it, when I looked at when I looked at the some of the history part in the in the um, preview. Um, I noticed in, I noticed invocations of thing of things like ancient e ancient Egypt and Rome. The whole thing with um, Car with Carthage is that is that the kind of approach you're going with of a historical fiction, but the but uh, magic is real within it. Well, yeah, essentially, yeah. Uh, the uh, even uh, from a practical perspective the the prologue the the, the timeline of the book starts with a uh, with a word that is uh, extremely no fantasy it's our word uh, it then uh, uh, goes in another other, along other pathways uh, and, and only then uh, becomes uh, high fantasy in this perspe perspective uh, so the, um, the historical and, and geographical context, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's still something we, we know in the sense. So we, we do have uh, the uh, ancient Rome, in this case the late Republic of Rome. Uh, we still have the uh, ancient Egypt, uh, specifically the Hellenized uh, Egypt. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, second century before Christ. Uh, and we have uh, the last moments of Carthage. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is this strong uh, setting uh, in a historical and geographical point of view. Yeah. Of course, uh, when, I'm, when I'm mentioning uh, uh, what is essentially a context of, uh, uh, of the Mediterranean basin, uh, this do doesn't mean that uh, the... Um, the supernatural context uh, is also limited only to the to this area, only to Europe and to the North, North, and, uh, Middle East and uh, North, North, North Africa. Uh, in theory, it extends to the entire world. Uh, we just don't know what's going on uh, beyond uh, certain points. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me personally, if I if I had if I had a nickel for every, for every time for every time up until this that I've ha that I've had a alternate history Rome, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. <laughs> uh, now, with that in, with that in mind, one of the things I do find interesting is in the golden rules you listed that everybody gets one reroll, uh, or rather. Mm -hmm. rather um, a dice can be rerolled one, once in a th in a um, dice roll. Um, sometimes that kind of reroll is used as an abil as an ability or a limited use feature, and you guys have it baked in. Um, what was your reasoning for doing that? Uh, well, essentially, we don't, didn't want to. Uh, well. Uh, there may be various sources of, uh, of a rule uh, uh, that allows you to reroll uh, um, one or more dice. Um, specifically, we just didn't want uh, occasions where uh, a character or even an NPC uh, would be able to, to stack uh, these rules so many times that, you, that you're uh, rerolling uh, uh, the same die endlessly. Or uh, at least multiple times, uh, we just uh, didn't want that to happen, and uh, we wanted uh, 
we wanted uh, just to be clear that uh, those rules, uh, that, that the Kano rule in particular, cannot stack on the single die. Mm -hmm. Now, f from, what it from what it looks like, you guys are using s some degree of an archetype system, but, it, but if the Master of Trade page on the preview is any indication, you're doing it a bit in a bit of a tree um, setup, which... Given that, given that you had that you had mentioned on the Kickstarter page about a love for the Total War games, was that an influence in terms of building this sort of advancement tree? Mm, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't believe that's uh, where uh, uh, my uh, my experience specifically. Uh, actually, we both played the Total War games. I just. Uh, uh, was a lot busier with it uh, in terms of uh, getting of modding it, etc. Uh, but uh, no, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that. Uh, I, I believe that comes uh, mostly with the um, uh, with the age itself. Uh, if, you, if one wanted to to, end, to pin it to a game, uh, one could easily pin the uh, the more or less uh, uh, age of the game. Uh, uh, to the um, uh, to the centuries handled by Rom uh, Total War Rome 2 uh, but the um, uh, the talents and the customization of the, of the uh, character uh, no they uh, they got nothing to do with that mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah mm, so, sorry if i may add something about that yeah the total war inspiration uh, as always is like as andrea said uh, it's more about like mm, the framework, uh, the background of the game. What 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 you cited, Master of Trade, is a uh, is one of the talent uh, that a character can have or have not in the game, and it's what creates our idea of customization. So it's like uh, talents are less. Uh, there are there are some inspiration that created uh, uh, our idea of talents, but uh, it, it is mostly not about the background, but it's about the customization uh, that a character can choose to have while growing up, while leveling up in our game. I guess the, 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 the other answer is just that in terms of, uh, uh, of talents in particular, we just didn't want the, the player to, to, go, to go down a forced uh, uh, specialization tree that just said... Uh, uh, okay, now you can uh, hit people harder. You just uh, keep hi hitting people harder and harder and harder mm -hmm. until uh, you're a master of uh, hitting people hard in the face. Uh, in most cases, we let you play with uh, with the direction uh, you're taking. Mm -hmm. That's that certainly makes sense. Now, when it when it comes to the magic system, which there there was a bit of a um, example given with he with heliomancy. Is it a case mm -hmm. where you guys are using a um a point based pool when it comes to using magic, or is it a case where each school of ma each school of magic, each school of thought with magic is going to be using the magic system differently? Uh, so the core system is pretty much the same for uh, across all the. Uh, the schools of magic, so to speak, uh, they each interface with it uh, with uh, certain nuances, uh, which may be uh, they have different bonuses depending on the context, uh, or they have uh, pretty dramatic, uh, uh, dramatically different ways of uh, uh, or actually interfacing with the with the spellcasting itself. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, there is a core system of magic, and uh, all all the so-called mages uh, uh, use it. Uh, when you say a point-based system, I do you mean uh, like you have uh, 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 token resources and uh, mana pools and stuff like that? Yeah. Um... I was I, I use that as a catch-all, whether it be mana points, whether it be spell points, just to differentiate it from the uh, more charge-based approach that you'd see in most editions of D&D, &D, for instance. 
Sure. Uh, so no, in that sense, no, we don't have a, a mana pool. We have a, a modular system when, uh, where you can, uh, uh, if you want, uh, build up, uh, co compose a, a specific spell to your specific needs uh, at that moment. Uh, and that, uh, uh, depending on how you, you built it and uh, how you upgraded it and uh, uh, which uh, little bits you uh, attach to it in terms of uh, uh, potential reach of the spell, uh, potential duration uh, and uh, total damage, for example, uh, that goes against uh, the difficulty of your throw to, to actually cast the spell. And that's pretty much the, the core of it. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, each, uh, each school of magic may have uh, uh, variations of how this works, uh, uh, which is not only uh, what exactly they're casting, because each uh, school of magic has a different uh, um, basis for the, the spells. So, uh, for example, what you can see in... Uh, I think you can see the, the word of power table in the preview. I'm not sure right now. Yeah, yeah, you uh, can. Okay, you can. Uh, so, for example, what you can see in the Heliomancy table, uh, that's just Heliomancers. Uh, nobody else can cast uh, spells based on, this, on those uh, effects. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, they will have uh, uh, similar spells. Uh, um, at least in terms of effect, so for example, they may have the exact, exact same uh, base damage or maybe a, a bit more uh, expensive, a bit more inefficient. Uh, and in other cases, uh, they simply won't have what the other school of magic has. Uh, and uh, that can, they can uh, be wildly different, uh, if, particularly with, the, with the powerful, powerful, powerful spells. Uh, uh, that may have very specific effects. Mm -hmm. All right. So with so with that in mind, I know that it's meant that's mentioned. You guys are, are doing classes, but is it a case where a class is going to determine what you're better at, what you learn? Are you going a bit freeform with, and are you going a bit freeform with um? create with creation and advancement of characters well uh, uh, we do have classes as you said but uh, we, we started with the idea that we uh, as Andrea said we do not want a character to be taken to um, a defined emperor built road for them so mm, we uh, we have a free form approach. So everyone starts with the creation of, of their character and then they grow up and they choose their talents and their aspects. And if they want to, they can be mages and so on and so on and so on. Uh, how we created classes, how we implemented classes, we didn't create them, uh, is mm, they, give, they give you a, a certain label. So you can... Uh, identify your character. You can even like move, mm, move, uh, move towards a certain objective, a certain like achievement of gaining a class, and become like I don't know a legendary or, or an oplite uh, through specializing yourself and checking the boxes to become a certain class. So uh, it also helps in creating like um, uh, NPC to interact uh, to interact with. Uh, it's easier when you have a certain pool of classes that gives you like an overview of normal or most common equipment uh, or uh, most common talents and so on and so on and so on. And also you can of course change classes as you grow up your character as you level up your character and mostly the most fun part is that your class can change its name as you move uh, through the world because uh, if you are a legendary in Rome and you, so you are dressed up as a Roman legendary you fight as one you you 
you will be recognized uh, as one. But if you move far, far away, and you go fight with your with your merry uh, group of adventurers, you go fight in Persia, or in, in Persia, in or in the Far East, or in the Far North. Uh, your class probably won't mean that much there, and you'll probably become a heavy warrior or something like that. So our classes are fluid; they they move with geography, equipment, uh, and what kind of talents or specialization you have accumulated you have uh, chosen so far mm -hmm. so so with that in with that in mind uh, one uh, one particular thing that was that wasn't detailed within the um, preview that I wanted to ask is aspects and how is and how how that works how that can be advanced and so on so, um, okay, so the, that, ah, should I go? Yeah, you can go, Andrea, no problem. Thank you. I love you. Um, <laughs> so, the so aspects are uh, pretty much the cornerstone uh, of, the, of the character creation in a way that classes uh, uh, probably aren't uh, by definition or by, uh, by the same fact that, uh, that, that a class uh, is more, a, of, more of, a lab, of, of a label. Uh, whereas the whereas the aspect is a more of a um, uh, it's much more internalized as a um, as a way of recognizing a person uh, or even how the, how the person recognizes uh, uh, themselves. Uh, that said, um, the as uh, whether a person is an aspect or not uh, is not even a, a much of a choice. Uh, the the aspect uh, what whether uh, what kind of aspect uh, a person is and a, and a person is uh, almost invariably an aspect in one way or another uh, depends uh, uh, on their nature. This nature uh, in a way brings up uh, uh, the, the difference bit, uh, the distance uh, between the natural world and the supernatural world. Uh, and in other words, uh, um, being an aspect uh, grants uh, uh, a person uh, ideal or divine powers coming from the supernatural world uh, onto the natural world, uh, depending uh, uh, on the both on the devotion of the person uh, towards a specific uh, set of deities in some cases. Uh, but more loosely speaking, uh, uh, it's uh, purely based uh, on uh, on your uh, nature as a person, on your uh, uh, character as a character. But forgive me for this, uh, for uh, your unique combination of uh, moral values, of uh, how you face the world, how you face yourself, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so, for example, uh, a person that is. Um, irrevocably belligerent uh, um, and, and uh, is pretty much built for uh, uh, a state of, uh, of rage, I can say, uh, that's probably going to be uh, an aspect of war if they are so inclined, if, if that's the way that uh, this, belligerent, uh, this belligerent, belligerent nature uh, uh, propels them for or, uh, or they can even be uh, an aspect of, of the wild, uh, which is to say uh, a person that uh, is um, not so much channeling this uh, internal uh, passion towards any, anything specific, so not towards war, uh, but it's just generally prey to its own uh, wiles and passions, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, uh, very much, um, uh, uh, very much built uh, on uh, on factors like this, and uh, you could say that uh, that an aspect uh, is uh, what makes a person that person, and uh, then you build a whole, uh, a small or a whole palace of uh, supernatural powers on top. 
that cer that certainly makes sense. So, with that in, with that in mind, as I as I understand it, you you guys are planning on on um on a co a core book, the ca the um, character sheets, as well as a campaign pack. Um, mm -hmm. The campaign pack, including the mo the uh, module um, Fate of Hispania. And with since it's since it's referred to as a medium length module, I'm guessing that it's one that is not that would not necessarily be built to be tackled in just in just one setting. It would likely require multiple um multiple um sessions. Oh yeah, it's uh, definitely a multi session uh, campaign. Uh, so Fate of Hispania is actually the uh, the story uh, for which I, for the first time, I, I acted as a as a game master. Uh, uh, I believe it took us, uh, I want to say, eight sessions, maybe, uh, taking our time uh, with uh, with banter and uh, finding out, finding stuff out and. Uh, uh, a bit of secondary quests and stuff and uh, stuff like that. Uh, no, it's not built uh, as a one shot. Uh, it's it's built as a as a story that progresses uh, as a um, as a trip essentially. There is a there is a component of uh, moving from uh, one place to another, and uh, that is fairly important to to what happens. Uh, think of it in the terms of uh, how. Lord of the Rings starts as a journey, uh, so you can't possibly develop the at least the first uh, the first book. You can't possibly uh, develop the first book of the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, with a party stuck in a in a single town. So that's more or less the same kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, the actual length of the campaign is up to the players. It's up, it's up to the narrator. Uh, it's up to how you uh, actually. It, it depends on whether you enjoy uh, expanding on on certain subjects or whether you just want to uh, get to the point. Uh, so in that way, maybe eight sessions will be too much for you. Maybe there might be too few. Uh, that I can't say. It's not a small story. Mm, it's not quite a small story. It can it can be short and it can be left and left and. Which definitely makes sense. So for the core book, what are you guys shooting for as far as the total page count? Uh, we are uh, between uh, two hundred fifty and three hundred uh, right now, mm -hmm. depending on. Uh, uh, on how many pictures you you put, you put in and uh, where you put in uh, put them, put them in and in what size etc. It uh, can vary a lot. Uh, yeah, let's say two hundred eighty. Right, I'd say I'd say that's a reasonable size. Uh, yeah. Um, also, we do not plan to uh, like the by core. We mean like. A real core, so we don't plan to add like uh, um, a background book or something like that. We we would love, and the project is to expand uh, the world building with stories and campaigns, but not with another book uh, uh, for rule set and so on and so on. So mm -hmm. the core book is what you need to play, and then there are the campaigns and so on and so on that will expand on everything else, but. N not uh, creating new rules besides some little like encounter rules and so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's in that sense. Yeah, that's all you need. Uh, you're not. We are not counting on uh, on on a uh, to say it is literally uh, on a player handbook uh, and uh, one one whole book dedicated only for the game master and uh, one more for the uh, setting, etc. That's it. Yeah, I could I could certainly get that. And for unlike say Mongoose Tra Mongoose Traveler, this isn't something that is 
dense enough that w that one book that one book might be over stuffing. That's what happened when I covered that a while back. Uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you two for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple to enjoy what goes down around here. Well, oh, thank you for having us. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you again for having us. Thank you. <coughs> and Pardon. Of, no worries. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>